Talk to me early days. Like, what's some of the first things you remember? Where were you born and bred? Give me that bit. You know, I remember my first sticker book was the 1990 World Cup in Italy. And I've still got it. And I think my mom still has it in the attic. <laughs> um, and I knew every single player that played in that World Cup in, in Italia 90, you know. And I'll never forget, even then, I was, what, seven? And I remember, you know, I had a little, I had a little um, growth on my face or a little board or something. And I remember Ireland getting knocked out by Italy and um, and crying with a, a pillow on my face and looking at the pillow, there was blood all over it. I'd, put, I'd worn whatever it was on my face away and there was blood everywhere. <laughs> um, so seven then, and even younger than that, you know, for a, lo- a lot of my time, I, I was involved in Gaelic games. Um, and Andrew were in the All Ireland tournament final in 1989, and that was a year before, so I was six. And living in Ballycastle, and you know, seeing the, the the appreciation and the godlike status that those players got was just <laughs> that was me. It was just like wow, like, and that was sport in every sport. As I say, you know, I, I love rugby, I love uh, football. You know, I, when I was 18, I played. I was playing like hurling Gaelic football and and football for Crusaders. You know, I was playing on county levels and I was playing for Crusaders um, under 18 team. So just, and I never put any time into school, to be honest. So <laughs> um, I kind of left school because of that. But yeah, just since then, you know, leaving sport, I played inter-county level for about six, seven years and um, got an injury that, then progressed to me having to stop and I see myself as an athlete even though Gaelic, Gaelic games are amateur um, yep. and that identity crisis sort of led me into a bit of a mental health um, mental ill health and from there you know found a purpose for me which was supporting people that potentially go through what I went through and um, and then you know from there right through different countries to Malaysia to I was in Ireland and England and Malaysia and now Australia where I've settled. So, yeah. Brilliant, man. I'm, let's pick up there after the intro, right? Because I'm so glad we got there. I'm so glad we got there so soon because there's a lot of stuff that I kind of want to chat to you about. So before we get into that, just want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, who are NI Connections. They are Northern Ireland's diaspora one-stop shop so it's part of invest and it's their diaspora program and their goal is to connect with people like chris who are from northern ireland originally and living overseas they have an amazing website niconnections.com and a great newsletter you can sign up for as well where you can stay in touch with everything that's happening across the entire northern irish network around the world so every single time the newsletter drops you're finding out someone's doing what in malaysia or like i didn't know there was a guy in brazil or like whoa this major investment's just like coming out of china it's like absolutely incredible and then the the kind of the opposite side of that if you're interested in moving home or you're debating about it maybe you're starting a family maybe you're thinking about relocating your business to belfast or uh northern ireland they have so many great resources for like dealing with all the practical stuff like how do i get my kids into school what's the easiest way to move back like all the kind of things all the obstacles they've taken care of it for you so it's a great resource and uh, we really appreciate them sponsoring this episode and making it possible so chris talk to me about you have that like godlike status you know you've become spider-man you've become like the superhero that you saw all the lads walking around you you then kind of in some ways became that what was that like to have that taken away from you and you mentioned identity i think we'll just pick up there yeah and just to, to go to that you know those those players were playing in an all-ireland final for antrim in 89 you know to get to an all-ireland final and be from antrim is is just you know it hasn't happened since um and that's how big it was and and you could see that in the people which probably reverberated to me and i could pick that up as a kid um, so me, that was my goal was to, to represent Antrim in an all out of final at Crow Park and, um, never happened, but the, the want to get there. And, and when I got to wear an Antrim jersey, it was always special. Every training session, you know, every, every, every time I got to go there, every time I got to play with players that were, were probably a lot better than me and play against players that were to this day, you know, still talked about, um, that was special for me. And just to have it at one stage in your life and be able to talk about it, I think is, mm. was really, really special for me. And I, I never once took it for granted. 
Um, but I was young and, and I do wish that I'd had it with the, the experience and the knowledge that I have now. And I definitely would have been a lot better. Um, I was never a regular player on the team, but I wasn't happy to be a squad player. I was always pushing myself to be better. Um, and I'm measuring myself against the players who were the best. Yeah. And I should say, you know, something that I, I didn't say about you in the intro is that like you've gone on since then, you know, you've worked with Olympic cycling teams, you know, head of wellness and the Australian national football team. So you've really like, you've taken, I, I, struggling with a, a, a kind of fancy way to say this. So I'll just kind of bluntly say it. It's like, you've taken Go the pain that, that you've experienced and you've turned that round as a way to like serve other people, which I think is, is really special. So if you tell me, if you kind of tell us about that breaking point, you know, like how did that start to, I guess, manifest itself in your life? Yeah. So when, when it did happen and, and I sort of knew that I wasn't going to be playing at, at that level again, or be able to play there, um, or do that to me, it was like, honestly, I just felt a shell of myself and how it manifested itself was that I, you know, I found myself angry. I found myself disillusioned. I didn't know what my purpose was or what my place was in the world because I couldn't. I felt like that was the, all that I wanted to do. And I was 25, 26. Um, and I didn't know what I would do with the rest of my life. I didn't know where my place was. I didn't know what my, I kind of lost my identity um, as a human being. And and it just manifested in being angry, you know, um, when, when people do lose their identity, like myself, you know, they take it out on other people and, I was never violent, but I was, you know, I was short with people. I, I struggled. I, um, there was a lot of negative thoughts going around in my head. Um, and it just became a cycle, a negative cycle and a spiral that I couldn't, I, I didn't recognize and I, I didn't know how to get out of because I was never taught as a young person, um, how to, how to recognize those signs and symptoms. I was never taught. Um, to reach out, I was actually, you were taught the opposite, you know, you, you man up, you don't speak about your problems. Um, you just get on with it. And I suppose that manifest that comes from, I feel back home, you know, a real strong working class, um, city where, you know, men are men, <laughs> you know, growing up, you know, you, you, you just suck it up and get on with it. Um, and because of that, I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone or I didn't know who to go to. I didn't have any, anything signposted to me um, of where to go. Um, and there was no support for players or or people, really, yeah. um, that I was aware of. So it just spiraled out of control. And and I, um, I, I remember planning to sort of take my own life or, or suicide and and it was the, the weirdest thing, you know, some things happen, they're coincidental or some people live in the universe. Um, but that day I, I, I was in a car driving home with my mom and, and that was, you know, when everyone had gone to bed, that was it. Like, but on that car journey home, um, me and my mom had a disagreement and I just burst out in a flood of tears. And I was like, oh my God, what's happening? You know, like what, what? why am I crying? And my mom said the same. She said, why are you crying? And I just said, I think I'm struggling with depression or something. I just, mm. I just don't have anything going for me. I don't know what to do, you know? So from then that was, to be honest, that was like half the floodgates were opened at that stage. And, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we just worked through, you know, what to do next. And even then I didn't, I didn't see a therapist. I didn't see a counselor. I didn't see a psychologist. And on hindsight, I probably would have. And, I would recommend anyone to do it who's going through the same thing. Um, that that would have en enhanced it. But to me, I wanted to understand what I was going through. So I tried to study human um, human relations or what I can't remember the exact title of the course that I'd done at uh, at Belfast Institute. Um, that enabled me to go and study psychology at university and 
And then I didn't really know many psychologists. I didn't understand like if there were sports psychologists, but I knew it was a thing. And I was like, well, I want to, I want to pursue this thing. Um, but I've never been academic because I never spent time in any period of time in school trying to be academic. <laughs> I spent all my time trying to be athletic. Sure. Um, and, and the other time was spent looking over your shoulder. Um, if you were getting hit with a pea shooter or someone was trying to nick something out of your bag or, you know, I, I went to a school that was a fantastic, amazing school, um, in La Salle and you know, there's many, many great people that come out of my class that have been doing amazing things. Um, but it wasn't a full grammar school. It wasn't a, it was, there was the education, a lot of the education was life stuff. <laughs> um, so listen, it's from then, you know, I just met, I met a friend of my mom's and, and she just sort of, sort of asked me one question and she said, what skills have you got from sport that you can bring to academia? You know, take the same approach to to that that you did with sport, and you'll probably just find yourself. And I did. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say that I I went full uh, academic for the first year of university, but um, <laughs> I probably I probably done the the old um, the old guy first year university student. Yeah. But yeah, I just took that approach and that's, that's how I kind of, I turned it around, but that's how it manifested itself. Interesting. So like, if you go back to the moment in the car, like I, I'm a suicide survivor as well. So, you know, obviously everyone's journey into it and out of it and around it is very, very different, but you know, there is a somewhat of a common understanding. I'm curious, like you're in the car with your mum, like, what is it about the disagreement or what is it about that moment that like, your, your own body almost betrays you right so your mind had like made like a plan yeah. it's like right this is what i'm gonna do lads this is it and then like from somewhere deep inside you your your, your tears betray you you know like it just kind of like oozes out of you what's that all about yeah i think in hindsight i didn't want to yeah i was i'm i'm gonna mostly i think what made it worse was i believe in um in naive optimism <laughs> Sometimes, you know, naively <laughs> optimistic, but then it's a double-edged sword, you know, when things don't go your way or for me, it was an identity crisis. It almost felt like doubly hard yeah. where like, I didn't see the optimism and I, and I wasn't being optimistic. So I wasn't myself, which then manifested itself in, in me not being who I would like to be, which then in turn itself makes you, you know, negative about everything. Yeah. Um, and you don't like who you are. So. For me, it, I think I'm an I'm an emotive person. Um, not just in I, I'm I do not I find crying okay. I cry when I need to cry, and I laugh when I need to laugh, and and I you know I try to experience everything to the fullest. So I think in that moment there was a part of me that just didn't want this to happen, um, and that was a way out maybe. Yeah, um, no, it's amazing. It's it's amazing how. Yeah, things kind of conspire against you, you know, um, if you're fortunate. And, you know, thank God that uh, both of us, you know, you're able to you're able to tell the story, you know. Isn't um, it great that we're both here having a chat uh, about? Oh, man, like it's it's unbelievable. And like if you compare it to like what you were saying, you know, when you were going through it, you just felt like there was no voices. There was no conversation in that sport world, in that masculinity world. And so, yeah, it's, it's cool that the times have changed. There's new challenges, but there's, there's also great benefits as well. If yeah. you like, you nice... obviously have... go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and that's, that's the, in the society that we, that I grew up in, you know, in the troubles, there was a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, transgenerational trauma. There's a lot mm-hmm. of PTSD. Um, and people didn't, people didn't know how to, um, how to unravel that or how to understand who they were and a lot of misunderstood aggression um, in men and, and even in, in women, you know, that, and not to me, you know, you grow up and you're the next generation mm-hmm. and you don't learn and you, you haven't got those positive role models. And I'm not saying that my dad wasn't a positive role model, but it definitely had an impact on him. Um, and And I know that now, you know, from all the things that I've understood and, he definitely had post traumatic stress and and I seen that. So for me, bottling up 
things just didn't make sense now that i look back yeah, yeah. I, I am, you know, I am a chronic bottler. Like, uh, I was I was crying over the weekend. I was away with a couple of mates and we uh, were having some, like, very honest conversations and it was one of the moments where, like, there was a crack in my dam. Every time it happens, mate, I'm always like, if I could just take a drug that would make me cry every week, <laughs> I would take it. Because, I, you know, I, and as I've kind of, like, even gone into fatherhood, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, in a couple of minutes, I've started to become better and better at like, you know, releasing the pressure out of that bottle. But there is something, I don't know if you want to call it intergenerational or if it's a Northern Irish thing or if it's a man thing or if it's a, if it's just a Matthew thing. It's an interesting thing, yeah. Yeah. I'm well, it's funny you should say that. To, that there's, to cry more. Yeah, and that's okay. And I think, you know, there's a great speech from a from a bas- college basketball coach in America who, who passed away from cancer, Jimmy Valvano. And one of his things in life, he says, is you should be moved to tears on a weekly basis. Wow. Um, uh, and and I think that, that one thing that always stuck with me, you know, little things from people just stick with you. And that that really, that's always stuck with me, um, that it's okay to be moved to tears on a weekly basis. Mm. It's interesting. A lot of the men that I, I look up to and I have looked up to kind of over the last 10 years are men who they present a lot of strength, but also a lot of vulnerability. You know, and I'm thinking there's like three old guys I know. You're talking 60, 70, maybe even one in their 80s. And I, I, I joke all the time, like, mate, have I ever had a conversation with you where you don't end up crying? Because <laughs> they're, they're, they've just got that, like, tender father's heart towards so many areas of life. And, you know, and yeah. you'll be standing there and they'll be talking about their grandkids or, you know, one of the, the kids in the community will do something. And it just it's just beautiful to see it just like expressing out of them, you know? And I'm like, that's, yeah. that's kind of goals. Like that's where I want to get to emotionally where you can kind of just like let it loose, let it go on all the time as opposed to a hundred percent coming up two weeks later or whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not, uh, demasculating to, to cry, which some people may believe, but to me, you know, there's a, a big, big debate and societal debate that we probably don't have time to go into, which is, you know, masculinity in, in the current age and for me you know standing up for what you believe in is is one of those things and if i stand up for what i believe in and and i show my son you know what a good life lived could be that's that's up to him what that looks like mm. but to show him some of those things and, and crying is not you know emasculating or demasculating wherever i'm not sure of the term yeah i don't think anyone will lose the term for that it's emasculating Make make it up as you go along, sort of scenarios. <laughs> so you obviously you've got like a real gift now, where you've walked alongside like countless athletes who have gone through something similar that you've gone through, or else you've kind of helped be a preemptive, preventative force in their life. If mm. you look back on yourself now, like what went wrong? Like for example, was it that you put all your eggs in the one basket, or what do you see? Are there recurring themes in people who experience something similar as yourself? That like massive identity crisis, and then all the pain that comes along with that after, say, losing a sport or transitioning into maybe the corporate world. Yeah, um, I think going at it with everything I had, there was two said two sides of this. Going at it with everything I had meant that I was getting the best out of myself. However, when it did did transpire the way it did that meant that my identity and that was that was gone in that moment because mm. I had forged a singular identity as an athlete. I was working, like I was working in, in a bank and I was working in uh, hospitality and, and I had jobs, but my identity was an athlete. Those jobs were, were based around having money to be able to be a, an athlete. They weren't, you know, it was, it was the wrong way around. Um, but it meant that I could try and get the best out of myself. But if I had a focused on being a brilliant um, colleague or a brilliant you know, whatever skill set that I was trying to develop, I wasn't trying to be a better person in a, in a bank because the job was to me was not what I wanted. It wasn't something I wanted to do for a long term. So yeah. I, the athletes that I do work with to do it really well, they they develop multiple identities. Um, and they don't forge a singular identity on sport. And I've seen it. 
um, when they get on the start line, for a lot of them, there is a lot of pressure. But there's just that resilience because they've got a, a really strong perceived social support. They've they've forged a an ident or a a holistic identity of of multiple things that that they see makes up who they are and who they are. Um, and it's not just sport, but they give their they give sport a, a, every chance of being the best that they can be. So. Yeah, it's and it's part of you know. There's a lot of research in, in resilience that, you know, in Olympic champions, um, where you know some of the factors when they are dealing with stressors, some of those factors that that mitigate, um, or that mitigate them not being resilient. You know, is having a, an optimistic or a positive personality and being motivated, uh, being confident, um, but perceived social support and, and a focus or a purpose. Is, is strong in terms of facilitating positive responses and, and then optimizing their sports performance. But that's sports performance and that can be applicable to other parts of life. You know, if you do perceive you have strong social support, so if I'm going through a really hard time and I have strong social support, I know how to reach out to. I know what how, how to support, who my support team is. And some of the things that we talk about with footballers now is, is being the CEO of, of your career because football beyond 16 is a business. And it's a career and it's, and it's not, it's not that it's not, not fun anymore. It's that it's serious <laughs> and it's people's lives and people's jobs are on the line, uh, uh, including their own. And they're up against contracts with other people. And, you know, even Australian footballers, they're on the other end of the world. Mm. Um, so building that understanding of what, what a football career looks like. And it's like me looking at, at a job in, in, in finance. If I go right, well, what, what is the average salary? What's the expected career length? What is the the potential of progression? Um, what how how do those people perform? What are the what are the the jobs? What is the the data around how many jobs there are going to be? What's what does it look like in in five years? Yeah. What does that industry look like in five years? And and can I maximize that? Because not everyone gets to the top to the Messi's and Ronaldo's, and not that I've ever you know worked with with those people, but Football is a career and I work in football. And if I'm going to support people in personal development and well-being perspective, then football football is, has the potential for you to have a career. And if you want that career, this is how you let's look at how you maximize that. Yeah, um, very cool. So, if so you yeah. tell, me, tell me then, how did you transition from working in the bank? I know you said you went and you kind of studied psychology and that maybe set you on the path, but you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you go from that place to, you know, having a full-time job and well-being in competitive sports at a high level? And like, how do you make money? How on earth did you end up in Australia? <laughs> Give me all that stuff. Um, okay. I don't know if I have enough time, but I'll try and get this really, really <laughs> succinct. Um, I chose where I studied really wisely. Um, I studied at Liverpool. Pool Hope University, um, and I had really good lecturers there who give a lot of time to, to students. Um, and then I done my master's at Liverpool John Moores, which was really connected to the football industry. A lot of the lecturers were, is a modern day term, they're pracademics. They, they're academia, but they, they work in the industry. Um, and a lot of, they work with a lot of sports teams. So it wasn't just academia. I didn't want to do academia. I wanted to work in the sports industry. So um, for me, it was getting the right education with the right people who had the right uh, contacts. Um, I had a brilliant mentor, uh, a first-time mentor in a guy called Dave McDermott, who's at Liverpool John Muir's University. And I'd done a, an internship supporting the, the sports scholars professional athletes who study at Liverpool John Moores um, and from there networked really, really well. Um, I'd done another internship in Dublin, which cost me, probably cost me more money than I earned. Um, yeah. I think I was earning, what well, I think I was earning about four or 500 euros a month um, living in Dublin. So, and that gave me 
an opportunity to to see what was actually happening. It actually built my confidence to go back and actually work in in the, the corporate world in well being sense and also the sports world. And I then wanted to do I tried to go the route of becoming a psychologist and um that was my plan. But I'd also done training in athlete um what's called TALS is talented athlete lifestyle sport, which is the the support supporting athletes with their life outside of sport that impacts their sports performance. Um and I applied for a job. A job came up in Malaysia. There was no jobs at home. Uh, in the player development space in rugby in Ireland, I think there's four or five jobs. Um, outside of that, outside of that, the Sport Ireland Institute maybe have two, three, possibly four jobs. In England, it was really um, competitive, the English Institute of Sport. So I, I, was, I just started to look globally. I, did, I looked beyond what I'd seen because for me, you know, I'd seen the world, I'd seen some of the world and experience. So I thought, you know, the world is open to me. Um, I'll do that for a couple of years and, and come home and hopefully I can land one of those jobs that, that you can't get unless you know someone. Um, so <laughs> I applied for a job in Malaysia and I got it. They asked, they asked me to be part of the first ever personal development program for the national sports Institute there and help design the personal development program there. Um, and it, it, a lot of challenges, um, but also an amazing place to work and an amazing people. Um, being exposed, I suppose for me, being exposed to that level of athlete, but also multiple belief systems, multiple religions, multiple languages, um, a different side of a different part of the world, you know, um, and, and just getting a, a greater sense of the, a different culture and exposing myself to different cultures. And football is a multicultural sport, um, as, a, as are most sports now. So I felt like I'd done a great job there and, and things transpired where it became uncomfortable to work there. Um, and it wasn't, it became not nice, uh, and not a nice experience in, in working life. Um, and I got an opportunity to move to Australia with the Australian cycling team to be the their athlete wellbeing engagement manager, which supports the the bike riders with their life outside sport. And then three and a half years, three years there, and football came along, and I threw my hat in the ring because it's I didn't want to leave my job at cycling. I had no intention of leaving, but. Football was something I've I've known since I've been four years old. Yeah, man. And I was, it was too good an opportunity. It was the first time they'd ever had this role with the wow. national team, um, the national men's team. So I threw my hat in the ring, and here I am. You know, just believed believed in myself and just had a go. Brilliant, man. So if I put it all together, it's getting a real choosing my education wisely, getting great mentors, um, networking really well, and immersing myself in in cultures and sports and understand getting into the sporting environments. Um, because one of the teams that I worked in in Malaysia was the national rugby team, you know, not <laughs> renowned for their rugby, but the head coach was an ex all black and a really well renowned all black. Oh, and I got, I got to, I got to work with Brad Mika and he was honestly just the nicest guy. Um, but also really, really intelligent, um, mm. really cared for his, his players. Like really, really cared on a deep level for his players, um, and experiencing that and and understanding that and not you know for me, my lens of the world isn't the way, and I've learned how to shape that depending on the environment that I'm in and and how to speak to people in different environments. So it's just building experience is yeah. is the last part. Yeah, yeah, I'm and believing that, in myself. That, that global opportunities piece I think is really interesting because as you said, like. You know, if you had have stayed locally, you maybe would have never even broken into the space. But you go abroad, like next thing you know, like you're being mentored by an all black, like you're going here, you're going there, one door is leading to another, you know, and that's, I think that's really, really exciting. Very, very cool. Yeah. And different sports, you know, one of the sports I worked in in Malaysia was a sport called Wushu and it's Chinese martial arts. And it's, it's, um, there was an athlete there who, you know, was a multiple world champion and, and just learning, learning how they operate, not going in with my way and understanding them. I actually learned more from, I've probably learned more from the athletes I've worked with than they've learned from me. And, 
that's not a <laughs> negative thing and I don't take that as a negative. So, and that's learning from people and there's, that's how I've worked is, is allow the person to design their future and you ask them what you need from them. And if they understand you well enough, they'll tell you, you know? Mm. Awesome. What was it like coming from Northern Ireland and going into those global opportunities? Like, is there any sort of benefit of coming from this place that was able to like differentiate you from other people going for the job or made you kind of like effective in your roles? You know, this might sound, uh, some people might uh, agree or disagree with this, but for me growing up in a, a nationalist community and, and seeing, um, you know, people from the other side. And I was always curious to go, well, I want to connect with people. I want to understand people. And when you grow up and you get a sense of, of, of who they are and, and they're just human beings and they just want to have a good life too. It's like, well, let's just navigate this world together. Um, and understanding people and wanting to know how people operate with different or people live, how people want to live their life from a different um, belief system, a different culture, different environment. To me, that's all. That's been something that's always helped me. Um, because going to Malaysia, my belief was, if let's talk about we ha what we have in common, and then we we build this trust or this rapport. We can talk about. Well, tell me about how your what this means in your religion, and tell me, you know, how. You, you know, what's important when you're doing Ramadan? You know, what is Ramadan? Why is it so important to you? How do you operate? Okay, well, let me try it for a bit. You know, like, I, and also learning little bits of the language. So meeting people, uh, meeting people halfway and going, right, yeah. well, what have we got in common first? And then let's see, then it gives us a platform to talk about why we're different. Yeah. And that, that has helped me from growing up in Belfast. Because I don't look at, I now I don't look at people and differences as wrong. I look at differences, just differences. It's just a different yeah. lens of the world. So that has definitely helped me everywhere I've gone. And even moving from Malaysia to Australia, you know, you think everyone speaks English and, and is white. You know, not everyone, but there's a predominant white sure. background and, and everyone speaks English. It'll be fine, but it's a different culture, different environment, different people, different ways of life. Um and that's always, that's always been a curiosity for me. It's like, what can I experience out of the world? And what, ex you know, when I do eventually leave the world, have I got the most out of it? Have I understood as many people as I can and connected? And, you know, I think one of the questions you asked previous to this was, you know, what's your favorite book? And the man's search for meaning is, is, one that is the first to my lips every single time because mm. finding purpose and a common a common ground or you know ex we're all in in this world and there is suffering so why not suffer together you know <laughs> 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 and find True. a common purpose that we can work towards and and when you work to something bigger than yourself i think it's it's one of the most amazing feelings yeah and i think that's what we're looking for you know it's like as you say, like, we're all going to suffer. That's just part and parcel of, of your life. It's like, you may as well put that suffering to something meaningful. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you may yeah. as well, like, if it's it's going to be really hard, it's going to be super painful. It's like, you may as well do something constructive with it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Oh. And, that, and, and listen, there was an experience in my life that, that changed everything for me when I went to California when I was 16. Um, and me and my dad had a, we'd done the, Big Sur and the coast of California in a VW Combi. Oh, um, wow. And, you know, it just stopping at beaches, meeting people who were having a drink, right? And they were all laughing and, you know, meeting real hippies, like real, real hippies. And they're all like, yeah, man, I love you, man. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm coming from Belfast, where at that age I was drinking, Yo, we drinking on that. the street corner, <laughs> drinking a bottle of cider, you know? And, and, you go up to, I lived in Finicky, you know, you go to Finicky Crossroads and one side's nationalist and one side's uh, unionist or loyalist and you 
disagree with each other and you have a you know whatever happens happens <laughs> and and then you go to I have this experience where it was like everyone loved everyone was really fun and had a drink and it was happy and I was like I like this I like this mm. feeling yeah and I came home and that I, I went back into sport and I just decided you know that life wasn't for me anymore yeah well wow. and that changed and I wanted to know more about you know people from the other side and uh, and how and some of my closest friends now are from loyalist and unionist side of belfast mm-hmm. um and that's okay <laughs> <laughs> you kind of we had a bit of a chat off mic at the very start you know so you've just become a dad is it six weeks in finley is that yeah your boy's yeah, name? yeah finley yeah so like you made a really interesting comment though you said you know i've been in sport for however many years it was and um, I've learned so much, but I feel like I've learned more about the psyche and mental resilience and, and life in the last six weeks than it all put together. Speak to that for me, would you? Yeah, and I specifically related that to my partner, uh, Marley. So I'm pretty sure that Marley and, and Bev and her whole family will be listening because they're massive fans of the podcast. Um, yeah, big shout out to Bev. <laughs> like, I. So who's Bev to you? Your mother in law? Bev is my... yeah likely going to be well yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be um wow. so yeah they're they actually um bev would, would have been um telling me about the podcast before i ever knew it existed so um and she's australian grew up you know she's from victoria and australia and now adelaide but um yeah bev is is marley's mom and and she was the one that put me on this so it's amazing how things turn out but to speak to the mental resilience part Marley, my partner, you know, seeing labor um, and seeing how she navigated labor. Um, even, you know, we got to the hospital and 33 minutes after we got to the hospital, Finley was born. But in that 33 minutes, Yo. from the moment she lay on the bed, she she barely made a sound. And I'm like, wow. Like, how do you summon the inner strength and the, just to go into that zone where you don't, you can be quiet mm. and, and and have that experience. So that I, I've seen many things in sport and I've seen many unbelievable examples of mental performance or mental fortitude and mental strength. And that, that would put a lot of them in, in, you know, way down the list now, um, to see her do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for what she done and, and how she brought Finley into the world. So yeah, big shout out to, to Marley and, and Finley and also to Bev and Barry and, and the Collins McBride crew. Amazing. Yeah, I mean honestly, like I, I was emailing Bev before the the show today. She was like, Are you actually <laughs> so sitting funny. down with Chris? This is mad. And like <laughs> Bev and I have been emailing for like it could be three years, it could be five years. Like she was I feel like she before was me and Marley knew each other. Yeah, like Bev was one of the first people to ever kind of like reach out and like, you know, say that they were enjoying the show. And I was always just like, yeah. you're in Australia. Like, this is mad. Like, what the yeah. heck's going on here? And, you know, it is. It's, it's those Northern Irish connections where coming from a big village like NI, it's so niche, but it actually opens up the whole world too. You know, yeah. it's kind of one of those like topsy turvy yeah. principles. And things. Bev's so, yeah. dad, Bev's dad, uh, Marley's granddad, uh, was born in Belfast. And and one of one of the the generation that that came to Australia, um, way 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 back when. Mm. So it's amazing how things turn out, and you know, learning things like Marley will probably kill me for this. Like she used to do Irish dancing, unbelievable. They used they used to do Irish dancing. So you know that it's it's uh, amazing how how small the world is. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Any um. You know, thinking about Northern Ireland, you've you obviously like come back now and then. Yeah. First of all, actually, talk to me about your thirtieth birthday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this brings all my words together, right? So, I enjoy a good night out. I'm not going to lie, and uh, my mom had a thirtieth sort of surprise thirtieth uh, dinner for me in the old cafe vaudeville. So I'm a, I'm at home in Belfast and. Mum has this dinner and we're there and having a laugh and just turn around to my friend and go, 
is that is that Howard Webb over there? It's like, nah, it's not hard Webb. We're in Belfast. It can't play vaudeville. I'm like, no, nah, I think that's hard Webb. You know, this person may like love sport, loves everything about sport, knows everything about everyone. Um, so I'm at the bar and Hard Webb's at the bar and I go, Hard Webb? And he goes, yes, that's cool. How you doing? I'm like, oh, not too bad. <laughs> so <laughs> to, to summon my inner, um, what's what, what do you call him? Shane Todd? To summer my yeah. my inner she and Todd, we were in all these student shots. <laughs> <laughs> Me, Howard Webb, uh, all these student shots. Um, Unbelievable. And that was just the, one of the most random things. Um, that's the longest story, the short of the story. Um, but yeah, that was the, that was a brilliant night. <laughs> and he like so just the World Cup final referee. He's just like knocking yeah. on Cafe Vaudeville. It's so funny, man. <laughs> and his assistant so his one of his assistants that ref had done the line in the World Cup final as well so they were in Belfast wow. and um, we ended up for a night out brought him round uh, brought him round Cathedral Quarter <laughs> <laughs> amazing how have you seen Northern Ireland change you know throughout your lifetime you have a unique perspective because you're away for huge chunks of time and then you kind of dip in and you dip out again you know, it's like yep. that classic thing where it's like even someone who's on like a like a fitness journey, it's like you, you don't see the incremental changes, but like then you you know maybe someone sees them, hasn't seen them in two years, like oh my goodness, like you look great, or like you're totally yeah. changed, or like whatever, whatever, whatever. Like I feel like you might have experienced something similar in Northern Ireland, but I'm always prepared to be wrong. Um, for me growing up, it was as I said the start trauma. I, I, you could just feel the tension and trauma in the air. Um, and there were still things happening and, you know, then to see it shift to the city centre being accessible, having a night out in the city, being able to enjoy yourself, being able to go around freely, be, um, having friends um, and socialising with people from different communities um, to now, you know, it's a minority that, that and a vast minority at that who have old school beliefs. You could go for for a night out, um, or a few, go for a couple of drinks, or go into the city centre, and not have to worry about getting searched, not have to worry about going through barriers, not have to worry about having your car, you know, stopped at a checkpoint. You know, going to school when I was at school, in primary school, we used to have you know British Army on the gates of the school with rifles, and to see that as a, and I grew up in Finnicky, as I said, and. There was only one bridge and and the M1 between Belfast and Lisburn, and it was at Finnicky, you know, 500 yards from my house, and there used to be bombs underneath it, and we used to go and watch, we used to go and watch the the robot defuse the bombs. That's not a normal upbringing. Yeah, that's not a normal li- life. That's the, kids shouldn't be exposed. Kids should be exposed to fun, happiness, laughter, you know. And growing up, and people do experience that um, now and. You can go and experience a, a brilliant social life. You can play sport. You can play mixed sport. Rugby. If if today was thirty years ago, I would love to play rugby. Yeah, would love the opportunity to, to uh, for it to be accessible in the community. Um, and for me, that's you know, that's Belfast, like the Belfast that I wanted, I've always wanted and I've always known, you know, there's still a long way to go. There's a lot of people who who want to keep bringing things up and, and making it us and them when it's not us and them. It's us and the them is the people who are in the past. Yeah. Um, yeah that's and that's, really, really that's nice. the only way to go for me. You know, people are people. They have different beliefs. Sit down, talk about it, have a chat help each other navigate the world. So Belfast has evolved incredibly and it's a place that I'm proud to say that I'm from um, yeah. and I'm proud to go back to. Mm-hmm. You know, when I go back, I look forward to getting home. What's one thing that you love doing back home that you just can't do anywhere else? There's probably quite a few there. Um, <laughs> there's quite a few. Um, do you know the first thing that comes to my mind? <laughs> It's just a nice big creamy paint of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to my mind, but you know, sitting down with my friends, there are people who I've had real life experiences with that I don't get to see very often and sitting down with them, you know, my best friend is, has just had his, his third kid. Um, I'm getting to see that, you know, getting to sit down with people, getting to watch, you know, a Gaelic football match, um, going up to my local club and, and listening to and getting the smell. And it's just, it's just such a unique, Belfast is such a unique place, you know? Um, yeah. Just getting amongst the people is, is my favorite thing. Having a, awesome. in many ways, and I just love a pint of Guinness. Yeah. <laughs> One of the I don't drink very often, asked. but I love a pint of Guinness. But when you do, it has to be creamy Guinness. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Question we ask everybody is like, if you could take anyone from Northern Ireland, dead or alive, out for a, a pint of creamy Guinness, who would you take and where would you take them? Uh, well, you know, Sean Napier, who I know was on the podcast previously, and he said George Bass. So that would have been one because I'm I'm a sports mad. I'm, I'm a, a big Manchester United fan from, from a very young age. And, you know, that. But I've always had a lot of respect for Rory McIlroy. I'd love to sit down with Rory and unpack his career and, and all the ups and downs that he's had. Um, and I was because he's he's come he's come through it all as well and and been really really successful. I'm, I met him once actually, and this is probably another reason why I said Rory McIlroy, because after I had my operation on my knee, I was actually working part time in box nightclub. Unreal. And I was working in the VI the VIP bar part. And Rory was in just after he won his British Open. And I was there on my crutches. I just went in because I had nothing else to do at the time. And he was very nice to me. He was he was asking me quite, you know, what happened? You know, how long your recovery? He was really nice. So I'd love to buy him a pint for just being a nice bloke. Um, yeah. And the other one, I just, for some reason, you know, Jamie Dornan seems like he'd be a good crack to have over yeah, a few he pints does, again. Doesn't he? Yeah, he seems like he'd be, he'd be a good... Uh, you that know an Irish bloke, yeah, um, and he'd be good at crack. Um, so yeah, and and I'd probably go to New York or uh, Kelly Sellers. Yeah, perfect, mate. Chris, land on the plane. Then final question, question we usually always end with: If you could go back in time to what age were you whenever you everything fell apart? For 25, 26. Right, so let's go there. If you if you could go back in time, say to you know a twenty five year old version of yourself, uh, and just catch that Chris by the arm as he got out of the car that day, what sort of things would would you want to say to him? It's not your fault, and everything's going to be fine. You know, follow your heart, follow what you believe in. Um, yeah, it's not your fault and everything's going to be okay and just follow your heart because hmm. I was a good person. I was never a bad person. So I was, yeah, I'll awesome. maybe yeah, and speak to someone. <laughs> <laughs> There's the practical side <laughs> nipping in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was it. Unbelievable. Chris, I love that man. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for listening, especially Bev. Appreciate it. Thanks for the uh, the heads up for today's interview. You gave me some pretty good, <laughs> pretty good show notes as well. Uh, thank you very much to NI Connections for sponsoring this episode. Again, niconnections.com is where you can check out all of their blog posts. You can sign up for their newsletter. And it just keeps you in the loop with everything Northern Irish diaspora related. And like I said at the top of the show, all that means is the network of Northern Irish people living overseas. So it's guys like Chris, it's people in China, it's people in the US and Canada all over the show. You would be surprised how many weird and wonderful and often high positions people from this part of the world have ended up. And uh, yeah, really appreciate them for sponsoring this episode and making this one possible. And Chris, thank you once again for today. Appreciate it. Thanks, man.